don't be afraid to take risks. Today, I'm going to be talking to you guys a little bit about the history of the high jump. And I think the story of how the technique began to be developed really portrays this idea. Uh, I think by the end of this speech, you'll have a better understanding of how the high jump developed and how one man's risk paid off for him. The high jump event had constantly been developing over time because people were trying to improve the technique in order to jump higher. But one man came along and changed all of this. So today I'm going to walk you through the origin of the high jump, how the event was invented, and some of the various techniques that were invented. And then finally, I'll introduce you to the man who completely revolutionized the high jump. So the first high jump event that was recorded was in Scotland in the 19th century. The first modern, it was in the modern Olympics first in 1896. But in those Olympics, it was the standing high jump. Uh, but then they decided that more power resulted in a higher jump, so they decided to evolve it into more of a running start. I thought this was kind of an interesting fact that America won the first eight Olympic high jump competitions. So that was pretty, pretty neat. When they first started, they landed in sand or wood chips, not these big fluffy mats that they use now. So when people began to come up with new techniques, they, they had to be centered around the landing and the safety because they couldn't just land on their back because they would definitely be injured. So the first technique, there was five main ones, and the first technique that began to be invented was called scissoring. And here, here's a diagram of it. So the competitors lifted their legs in alternation of one another over the bar. So the advantage of this technique was that part of the leg is always lower than the bar. And this allowed the pelvis to get higher up in the jump. And the key to high jumping is trying to get your center of gravity as high as you possibly can over the bar. So this was a really big invention because it was able to help the competitor get their center of gravity higher than just standing and lifting their legs over. So next, the eastern cutoff was invented. And this was very similar to scissoring, but the upper body was rotated horizontally at the peak of the jump, which you can see in image five here. And since the trunk was lowered then, this raised the pelvis even higher. So this was more effective than scissoring. But the disadvantage of this technique was that it required a lot of flexibility. So not very many of the competitors could actually do this technique. So then the western roll was invented. And the competitors cleared the bar on their side with their takeoff leg tucked underneath them. So you can see that in image four and five here. This didn't really improve the effectiveness of the jump much, but it did require less flexibility, so more people were able to use it. After that technique, the straddle technique was invented. And competitors would clear the bar face down, and they straddled it with their legs as they went over, which that can be seen in image four and five here. So I bet now you're asking, how did it come to the technique that's used now? Because obviously if you've seen any high jump competitions on TV or anything, none of these are used today. So that all started when a man by the name of Dick Fosbury came along. He was a native of Portland, Oregon, and as a teenager, he was unable to achieve a personal best of over 1 meter 80, which that would have been about 5'11". He used the scissoring technique when he jumped, but in 1963, when he was 16, he began to invent a form that evolved from scissoring. He decided that as he went over, he was going to try to lift his hips up and lay his upper body back. And then he started running in with diagonally and then curving as he came into it. And this kind of developed the back first technique. And he was able to do this because now they were starting to use soft pads to land instead of sand and sawdust. So 
He went on to compete at Oregon State University, and in 1968, he made the Olympic team. Um, his new technique that he was using was completely unseen and revolutionary, and people didn't people thought he was kind of crazy because he was the only one doing anything like this. But in in the 1968 Olympics, he jumped two meters twenty-four, which would have been about seven four and a quarter. He won the gold medal. Oh, is the picture now? Um, did it go away? I think you might have lost your. Um, that's our technology man. Okay. He won the gold medal and he set a new Olympic record. So he went from 5'11 to 7'4 and a quarter. Um, at the 1972 Olympics, 28 out of the 40 jumpers used this new technique. So it kind of began, began to be embraced as the new standard of high jumping. And today, this technique is known as the Fosbury flop, named after him. And pretty much everyone uses this technique now. So this, this weekend at my meet, I was actually able to meet him just a few days ago. And I got to talk with him quite a bit. And that was a really cool experience because you know, getting to meet the person that invented the sport that you do, that's a really unique thing, and it was really cool to get to talk to him. And I thought it was kind of ironic timing that I'm going to do this speech in a few days, and I got to meet him. So today we looked at how the high jump originated, and then I walked you through some of the various techniques that began to evolve, and then we looked at how Dick Fosbury completely changed the technique and changed the face of high jumping. High jumpers had constantly been searching for new techniques that could improve their performance until Dick Fosbury came and changed it all. I think we can learn a really valuable lesson from Dick's story, and that is to never be afraid to do something different and try something a new way, because you never know how it may turn out. I have to say this, the bar has been set. Wow.